I'm just your servant. Whatever you want to say to your people, Lord, use me. We've come to the final meeting. Some are here for the first time. Some of us, we've come into the story late. We don't understand the storyline. We don't understand the chapters, but we've come to the final one. And I just pray for the authority of the Holy Spirit. Remove every distraction, Lord. May we see that we're not here by accident, but that we're here by providence. That we could have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you have us here because there's something special that you want to speak to us. Remove every prejudice. Remove every idea of what this person or that person, and may we listen for the voice of God. Lord, I recognize that this world is coming to an end. And the sad reality is the majority of the world has no idea what is about to take place. Men have been deceived by religious leaders, by politicians, by adults or children, even by our own selves. Lord, we have deceived ourselves. But we're so thankful that there's hope and help in Jesus. We're so thankful that there's help in God. And I just ask, Lord, that you will remove every distraction. That angels will walk up and down in this assembly. That we might recognize an atmosphere of a totally different presence. Lord, we have lost a sense of the holiness of God. We can come into the church of God with gum in our mouths. With cell phones on. And Lord, it is only your mercy we're not consumed. But I pray that you will do something tonight. That you would take this feeble, mortal man. And that you would allow the Spirit of God to speak to every one of our hearts. Including my own Lord. For there is no merit in preaching truth. If we will not accept these principles in our lives, we of all men are most miserable. And so I just ask, Lord, that you would glorify thy Son. That thy Son may glorify thee. Now is the time, Lord. Now is the time. Lord, I believe that there's some soul that's on the balance of salvation. That some soul needs to make a decision before tonight closes. Please, Lord, impress that dear soul. Please, Lord. Please. Please, Lord, use us. Speak to us. And abide with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, brothers and sisters, I never wanted to stand before the people of God to proclaim his message it was never my desire I was walking in the world and I was going toward the way of hell but I'm so thankful that Jesus is looking for our salvation amen in fact if you'll take your Bibles I want you to look at something for a moment in the book of Isaiah chapter 62 in the book of Isaiah chapter 62 I want you to notice something very interesting. And I remember telling the Lord that all I wanted was an experience with God where I knew Him for myself. I thought that if I could just live a goodly life that I wouldn't have to tell anybody about it. Did you know that? No desire to ever stand before a pulpit or preach. All I wanted was to know for myself what the Bible believed. But I understand something now that I did not understand just those few years ago. I understand something of the way the Lord works. Notice what this says. I want to read something before I read Isaiah. In Great Controversy, page 605, the prophet of God says, In every generation, God has sent his servants to rebuke sin both in the world and in the church. 
But the people desire smooth things spoken to them. And the pure, unvarnished truth is not acceptable. I tell you, from the very first time I decided to pick up the Bible, I had no intention, no desire to want to share these cutting truths. But, but God showed me and said, if you love my people, somebody has to let somebody know. You see, we're living in a time, my friends, when the majority of the world has no idea what's about to take place. And this says, many reformers in entering upon their world determined to exercise the great prudence in attacking the sins of the church and the nation. They hope by the example of a pure Christian life to lead the people back to the doctrine of the Bible. That's what I desired. I said, Lord, all I want to do, I just, I just want to live your truth. I don't want to have to say anything about it. And all of a sudden, the Lord began to start moving upon me and say, will you tell my people what I said? You see, brothers and sisters, what men will fail to do, God says he is going to get watchmen that are going to give the trumpet a certain sound. So the multitudes, they won't have to wonder what is the way of the Lord. Like John the Baptist, they will hear a voice behind them saying, this is the way. Walk you in it. In fact, it goes on to say, it says, but the Spirit of God came upon him as it came upon Elijah, moving him to rebuke the sins of a wicked king and an apostate people. They could not refrain from preaching the plain utterances of the Bible, doctrines which they had been reluctant to present. They were impelled to zealously declare the truth and the danger that threatened souls. Says the words which the Lord God gave them, they uttered, fearless of the consequences and the people were compelled to hear the warning do you know that right now satan wants to silence this message did you know that satan would do everything he can to silence this message i have seen men that have stood behind this pulpit and they said to me you will never stand in my pulpit with that message and i said it's not my message it's the message of god and I am afraid when man would say that because I have seen, as a result of that, I have seen God lay people to rest and bring me into that church so that his message, not me, but that his message could be heard. God is looking for anybody that will pick up his word. There is nothing special about man. God is going to take the weakest of the weak. God is going to take this last weak an ignorant generation to do a work that could not have been done in any other period. And you know who's going to get the glory? Not man. It's going to be God in heaven. In fact, brothers and sisters, notice what the Bible says. Because somebody says, why must you preach those standards that's so high? Oh yes, the Bible says in Isaiah 62, beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. The Bible says, For Zion's sake, will I not hold my peace and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth and as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth I will not be quiet until God's church is brought back unto primitive godliness we have been told by the pen of inspiration that this church, the seventh day of his church, right now, the majority of God's people are not in this church. Let me say that again. The majority of God's people are not today in the seventh day of his church. Many of them are in the Catholic church. They're in the Protestant churches that are going on Sunday. They're in some of the Muslim faiths. Many of God's true children are in other denominations, and yet they don't know that God is getting ready to move them into this place. While the majority of Seventh-day Adventists are getting ready to be shaken out. You see, God is interested in souls that have been totally surrendered to Jesus. And in many other denominations and faith, they have totally surrendered. They simply don't have the truth of the Bible. But brothers and sisters, it's a shame when God can give us all this light and yet we can sit on this light and act like, well, we don't need it. It was for a hundred years ago. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, for Zion's sake, I will not rest. 
I will not hold my peace. I don't care what the cry is. God must have somebody that will give the trumpet a certain sound. Somebody that will not be afraid to lift up the message that is truth for this time so that souls can be saved. In fact, the Bible says in verses 6, it says, I have set watchmen upon the walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord do what? Keep not silence. Verse 7 says, And give him no rest till he have established, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Do you know that this little group of people called Seventh Adventists, very soon they're going to be thrown before the entire world. And the world is going to hear when Seventh Adventists are persecuted for believing in the commandments of God, people all over the news, CNN is going to watch it. Courtrooms are going to be filled with the talk of Sunday legislation and for the first time souls are going to hear the truth that have never before heard it and we're only just a little way away from this event. We studied in these meetings that this financial crisis has been prophesied by the Bible. We predicted and showed that this was coming and it's not going to get better. The $700 billion is going to do nothing. It is going to get worse and worse. We're going to see a complete collapse of the United States economy. And brothers and sisters, it's moving toward the time that the Bible says that no man will be able to buy or sell save he that have the mark of the beast and the number of his name. And God needs somebody today that will go through his church. Notice what it says in verse 10. Go through. Go through the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones. Don't compromise the standard. Don't lower the standard. I don't care how many men come together and say it's all right to compromise these truths that God has given us. The Bible does not say it's going to compromise. The Bible says lift up a standard for the people. And brothers and sisters, when the standard lifts up, there's only one way to meet the standard. You know how to meet the standard? Unless we know the standard bearer, there's no way we can reach that standard. Unless we know Jesus, there's no way that we're going to meet this experience. But when God's work is accomplished, the Bible says in verse 12, And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called what? You mean to tell me people are going to be looking for you? You know when a man is thirsty and there's only water in a one particular place, people start going after that water. This church is getting ready to be sought after. When they are returned back to the Lord, it says they will be sought at and a city, what? Not forsaken. But before God can do that, you know he must break us. And I'll never forget I was playing basketball some years back and I used to start as a point guard and we would win championship at the championship before I knew better. And I remember one particular game that I had just crossed somebody over and shook him and was getting ready to go to the goal and go for a dunk going backwards. And it surprised the people. They never thought that, that I could jump up this way and so they were not looking for it. And when I went up to jump, something happened where I could not get as high as I normally thought I got. And I fell on my back. And I was there sitting down or laying down on my back. And I remember that somebody was there. They, they looked at me and they said, your shoes came off your feet. And so I was getting ready to look down and put my shoes back on. And I looked down and I noticed my shoes was not off my feet. That what had happened that I had twisted my ankle so much that my ankle had literally flipped around and my foot was pointing backwards. And I looked down and Bless my heart, I didn't know any better at the point. I just said, man, I'm not going to play basketball for a little while. Then I went down and very quickly, the only thing I think to do is put it back in place. So I grabbed it and, and turned it back around. And everybody said, oh! And I got up. I kind of trying to walk on it a little bit. And it, it would not, uh, I couldn't get any good feeling on it. And I said, you know, I think you need to take me to the hospital. I left and someone wheeled me in and took me over to the hospital. 
And I remember as I was going in that the doctor began to look at my leg and he said, man, I can't believe you turned it back. He said, that was pretty good. He said, there's only one problem. He said, you put it in the wrong place. He said, I have to re-break it so that I can put it back in the right place. I said, all right. And so he began to start twisting on my ankle and putting it back in and I guess doing what those doctors do without anesthesia, just moving it. And all of a sudden I'm looking at him. He said, did I get it back in the right place? I said, did you? You're the doctor. <laughs> and he said, but, but, but you're not screaming out. Most people scream. You have a high pain. Time. I said, just put it back in place. And he put it back in place. He said, because if I don't put it back in place, it won't heal right. And he put it back in and later on I had to have surgery on it. It was so bad it, it, it had ripped the, all the muscle of my leg and broke the bone on the side of my knee. And they had to put pins to put it back together. But he said, unless we put it back in the right place, it won't set and heal properly. And you know what the problem is sometimes? You see, we don't want to be hurt by God. We don't want to be cut by God. We don't want to be broken by God. But unless God breaks us, he cannot build us up. Unless God hurts us, he cannot heal us. Unless he cuts us, he cannot bring us back into the right position. But the problem is, too many people, once they're broken, they see that their life is messed up. Normally, we try to put ourselves back in the right place. And you know what happens? We put ourselves in the wrong place and so God in love we're broken we're ready now for something to happen we're ready to try to put it in the right place but the tendency is to put it not in the place that God wants us to put it and unless we have a divine physician unless we have Jesus Christ to make sure that once we're broken we're put back in the right place then everything that happened before to lead us to that breaking is in vain tonight we want the great physician to put us in place. What do you say? Tonight, we want the great physician to refocus us, not on what the world does. You say, I had something else I'm going to share, but, but the Holy Spirit is moving me into a different direction. I can't talk about the events. I was going to show you some more events and showing us that we're in the last few months, but, but I believe those who have been coming out to the meetings, you know that. And we're going to have materials back there with DVDs that go through all of these events and show clearly that we are living in the last few months to the last few years before this National Sunday Law is passed. And unless we know Jesus, we're not going to be ready for this crisis. And so, brothers and sisters, let's just pray one more time before we open the word together. Amen. Father, anoint your words. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 21. To the book of Luke chapter 21. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Now, if you have your Bibles, I pray you didn't come to church without a Bible. Amen. Now, I can tell those who've been coming to this meetings versus those who have come the first time. All I have to do is say, raise your Bibles. If you, if you raise your Bible, if you have the Bible. Now, if you raise your Bibles, I know you've been at these meetings. Amen. Now, you see, we found out that it is not wise to come to church without Bibles. We have found that though it has become fashionable to enter churches without Bibles, the only way that we can know the truth is not by the opinions of a man. I don't care who that man is or what church that man belongs to. We are even told that in this church there will be men that stand behind this pulpit with torches that have been kindled by the hellish torch of Satan. And the only way to know the difference between the voice of God and the voice of men, the Bible says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And the great reason why we have so many different denominations is because we have a lot of Bibles and yet many people listen to opinions instead of Bibles. If there is only one Bible, there should really only be one church. But the problem today is that man today would listen rather to what man has said about the Bible instead of studying the word of God for themselves. But I've told you, brothers and sisters, that the Antichrist 
is soon to make his marvelous appearance in our sight that the last great delusion is soon to open before us. And we've been told in this last hour that Satan is going to work miracles that are going to be so, so looking like the genuine that it's only going to be possible to distinguish between them by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. And unless we come back to the Bible, we're going to be deceived in this last hour. And Jesus said, brothers and sisters, when those disciples came to him, and they said, tell us, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world. And Jesus gave them clear signs. In fact, notice what the Bible says, beginning in verses 9 of Luke 21. Beginning in verse 9, are you there, amen? Yeah. Notice what it says, beginning in verse 9. Let's read that together. The Bible says, But when ye shall hear of what? Of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not yet, it's by and by. In other words, when we see the wars and the rumors of wars, God said, this is not it, this must be, there is still something coming greater, and we have learned from night after night that tonight we are on the verge of a great crisis. Right as I speak tonight, the world is getting ready to make their decision over the seal of God and the mark of the beast. And tonight, it looks as if there is a great number of denominations. We can list hundreds upon hundreds of different denominations and religious faiths, but the Bible says that when this thing comes to pass in just a few short months, that every denomination of this world are going to be split into just two religions. It's not going to be 101 and 102. The whole world is either going to be on the side of God or going to be on the side of those who receive the seal of God or they're going to receive the mark of the beast. The Bible says there's only two churches. The Bible says that there's that woman of Revelation 12 and that woman of Revelation 17. I'll never forget, I was there going to a funeral in California. And I was there at this particular house, and I was there at the, getting ready, and I said, you know, I always meet different of the religious faith. I don't want to just always try to make it like I'm trying to show them something they don't, don't, don't know. And I was out there, and I saw some Jehovah's Witness coming up the road. And I said, there are many sincere believers in the Jehovah's Witness faith. I said, Lord, I don't want to have to try to talk with them today about the Bible. They're going to try to convert me. You know what happens, don't you? And so I said, I'm going to make sure that I, that I leave my Bible in the house so I'm not even tempted to, to show the truth to them. I said, I know they're sincere. So I went into the house and I put my Bible in and then all of a sudden, you know, providence is a strange thing. All of a sudden, they were way down the road and I quickly went in back in the house and then I said, well, let me, I, I need to get something for my wife. And I went outside and all of a sudden, guess who was at the door? I said, oh, Lord. And so I stood there and the two were standing there and they said, do you know that the world is getting ready to come to an end? I said, yes, I believe that very sincerely. I said, I believe that too. They said, oh, you believe that? I said, yes. All the signs point that the world is coming to an end. They said, that's right. They said, are you sure you're in the right church? And I said, I'm sure I'm in the right church. And they said, well, I'm not so sure if you can be so sure. Do you know what the Bible says? And I said, well, tell me, what does the Bible say? And so they began to start talking about what the Bible says about the church and how many people are in the wrong church. I said, well, that's very interesting. I see you have a Bible there. I said, turn in your Bible to Revelation 12 because the Lord said, just tell them the truth. I said, okay. I said, turn in your Bible to Revelation 12. I didn't have my Bible, so I said, use your Bible. So they go to Revelation 12. Now I said, do you know that in the Bible, the Bible likens in the book of Revelation a woman to a church? And they said, what? I said, look over in Jeremiah, and they went over to Jeremiah, and I showed them the text which said that, that, that a, a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. A pure woman represents a pure church, and a harlot woman represents a harlot church. And they looked, and they said, man, i never seen this. This is getting a little bit too deep for me. I said, no, but you stop me. Amen. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. And I started talking, and I said, now, this says the church. And I said, this gives an identifying mark of what God's church should look like. I said, look at this pure woman. This is a pure church. I said, look at all the identifying marks, because I believe anything the Bible says. If my church does not line up with this, then I'm going to a different church. I want to follow Jesus. I'm not interested in following a man. 
I'm not interested in following the ideas or the opinions of men. I'm only interested in following Jesus. And Jesus said, he did not live by tradition. He lived by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And a true Christian, they're not going to listen to what their pastor says or their church says if it violates this Bible. And so I started talking with them and they looked and the little girl that was with the person looked over and said, what are you going to say to that? <laughs> and mother looked over and said, well, I wasn't expecting this. And I said, now, are you sure that this is your church? And she looked a little bit stable. I said, I know you're very sincere. I said, there are not even people who have the truth that are walking and, and knocking on doors like you are. You know, if we had the truth, shouldn't we be knocking on doors? And I said, you are very sincere. I said, if you are sincere and you're open and honest, God will lead you into the right truth. I said, if I were you, I would study this chapter. And they said, but. And I said, well, you know, the Bible says what day the Sabbath is. And they said, oh, you're talking about that Sabbath. You know that, 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 that all you do is, is, is you're taking pagan traditions. Don't you know you're keeping pagan traditions? And they said, you can't keep a birthday. You, you know, in, in many of the faith of Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't celebrate birthdays. Now, I said, now, that's not in the Bible. They said, what do you mean? I said, the Bible says in Psalms that teach me to number my days. And a birthday numbers the days. I said, the Bible told us to number our days, to apply our hearts to know wisdom. That's what the Bible says. I said, but now that you brought up paganism. I said, do you understand where Sunday worship came from? And they stepped back for a moment because, you see, they understand. They studied through paganism. And they went back and I said, do you know that this is how we got the names of the week? Sunday for the honor of the sun god and Monday for moon's day and all the rest. I said, if you say that it's pagan to celebrate Christmas and all the rest, you tell me why you are still going to church on Sunday. And I said, you tell me why. And, and, and she said, but, but nothing in the Bible tells us what the day is. I said, wait a minute, you have a Bible. Turn to this. And we went from text to text. And she looked there, and all of a sudden, she began to start closing her Bible. And the, the little girl said, but mother, aren't you going to say something? And she went back in, and she, she went back into her Bible. You know, the Jehovah's Witness, they have studies that they go through. And it was in the Bible, and she said, well, I can't deal with it now, and I have to bring somebody back to deal with this Sabbath thing. And I said, but wait a minute, this is your book right here, is that right? She said, yes. I said, this says that this is a study on the Sabbath right here. And I turned her book open and opened it right to the Sabbath. And she began to recognize that there's only one day that the Bible says the Sabbath. It says the seventh day of the week. And when she looked at it, all she could do was close her book. And I said, look, I know you're sincere. And because you're sincere, all you have to do is pray to God and God will lead you into the truth. You see, brothers and sisters, we must come to the place where whatever man says, we must search everything and make sure that everything we believe is based on the words of Jesus. Because the Bible says in Luke chapter 21 that this is not going to be the last thing. The Bible says all the world is going to be divided into two great classes. The Bible says, in fact, look at what it says beginning, beginning in verses, beginning in verses uh, 8. Notice what it says. Let's go back for a moment. It says, and he said, take heed that you be what? Not deceived. For many shall come out. In my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draws near. Go ye not therefore after them. In other words, we're going to be after to know the difference between the true and the false. He says that it is going to continually get worse. In fact, in verses 10, look at what it says. The Bible says, would you read it with me? Nation shall do what? Rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. And famines and pestilences and fearful sights. And great signs shall be where? They shall be in heaven. But notice verse 12. It says, but before all these, they shall lay their what? Their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up to the synagogues and into the prisons being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake and it shall turn to you for a testimony that all of these things that Satan is going to throw against us to try to turn us from God all of the persecutions and the troubles and the tribulation is going to be turned for a blessing and the Bible says brothers and sisters that God is going to give us some signs in Luke 21, beginning in verses 25, it says, And there shall be what? Signs in the sun and in the moon 
and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring men's heart failing them for fear and for looking what? After those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see who? The Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then verse 28. Would you read it with me? I love this verse. It says, And when these things, what? Begin to come to pass, be afraid. Is that what it says? You see, once we see these things are taking place, and they, we show them this in our, in our course of our studies. Once we see these things taking place, it is not time to become afraid. The Bible says that when you see these things begin to come to pass, then do what? Look up and lift up your heads. Don't look down. Lift up your heads. Why? For your redemption draweth nigh. In other words, this great plan of redemption is about to come to a close. Now I want to ask you something. When Jesus said, look up, do you know what he meant? Do you think he meant look up into the sky and watch the sun and the moon and the stars? No, no, no. Jeremiah says, shall I look to the hills? Where comes my hope and salvation? He said, no, no, no. My hope is from not those hills. My hope is from the Lord. You know what was up in heaven that Jesus wanted to direct our attention to? Go to the book of Hebrews. What book did I say? Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 8. The Bible is clear. That there's something up in heaven that deals with our redemption. And if ever we're going to get help from Jesus to put us in the right place, we must make sure that our eyes are fixed on Jesus. And my friends, tonight I want to ask you, where is Jesus? Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary. Is that right? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, beginning, beginning in chapter 8, notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, let's read that together. It says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such and what? An high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty where? Amen. So when Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, don't become afraid, just look up. And one sense, this was Jesus directing our attention from earth to heaven, from man to Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, beginning in verse 2, a minister where? Of the sanctuary. And of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Verse 5 says, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to what? The pattern showed to the amount. In other words, everything that happened on the earthly sanctuary was a representation of what God was going to do in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, up there in the heavenly sanctuary, do you know that God is offering a new deal? Now, we've been studying about that new deal, haven't we? We showed you that just what we saw in 1929. When the Great Depression started and it got so deep that men lost their jobs. Banks began to fail businesses went out and it was so bad in the United States of America that the people demanded the government to intervene. We show that that model is beginning again in an infinitely deeper way. That just as in 1929 that Satan was going to bring a new deal, that so in 2008 we are getting ready to enter a depression greater than what happened in 1929. This depression, this economical collapse that the Bible prophesied of over 2,000 years ago told us that this is going to, be, it's going to make the Great Depression of 1929 look like days of great prosperity. And my brothers and my sisters, you better understand that after a few years, about three years later, in 1933, you remember what the government did? They came out and said, we can help you out of that problem, that ruin. We can give you a new deal. Mark my words. And if you don't believe me, if you think that this is strange because you haven't been studying with us, then you just wait for the next few months to the next few years. See, God is trying to hold back time and I'm praying, Lord, give us just a few more years because my brothers and my sisters understand something. We are going to see that the world is going to be told that the only way to stop the economical devastations and the environmental calamities like fires and floods and earthquakes means that we must pass a national Sunday law. That in the United States of America, man is going to be told that we need a day of rest because man has gotten away from God. Have you heard that today, that man has gotten away from God? 
Have you not been hearing the religious rights talking about the need of bringing back morality to the United States of America? And man, we are going to see all of the Christian denominations unite and they are going to force the people and even the government to pass a day of rest honoring the Sunday worship. And my brothers and my sisters, there are going to be men that thought that this was strange and fanatical and a figment of our imagination. And I tell you this, I tell you before it comes to pass, so that when it comes to pass, you might believe. If you have never heard anything like this, when you see that national Sunday law pass, remember this day. Remember that you heard it here from the Bible, from the church of God. And remember, my brothers and my sisters, that this is going to be the idea of bringing us out of the economical depression. And he's going to offer a new deal, which is a union of church and state. The amendment of the Constitution is going to take place in this free country. We're going to see it. And the Bible said it is going to be nothing more than the enforcing of the mark of the beast. But now, my brothers and my sisters, that's Satan's new deal. But everything that Satan does is just a counterfeit of what God is doing. Do you know that God has a new deal? And the only way to refuse the new deal of Satan is to accept the new deal that God is offering. I wonder what the new deal God is offering is. Notice what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 6. There in heaven, he's doing it. The Bible says, beginning in verse 6, but now what? Have he obtained a more excellent ministry? By how much, but by how much also he is the mediator of a better what? Covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for what? For the second. And then the Bible says in verse 2. Verses 9, it says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, but can they continue not in my covenant and regarded them not, saith the Lord. But verse 10 says, would you read it with me? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will do what? Put my laws where? Into their mine and write them where in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people you know what this is this is God's new deal this is God's new covenant you see in the old covenant that law was written on tables of stone but in the new covenant the Bible does not say he's going to change that law in the new covenant God is going to take those same Law that was written in the stone and he's going to write it in our minds and he's going to write it in our hearts. Now my brothers and my sisters, when he writes that law in our minds and hearts, you know we're not going to ask to know Jesus. Did you know that? Nobody's going to run to each other when they accept the new deal. Nobody's going to run to each other and say, it's time for us to get to know the Lord. When you accept the new deal, you will know Jesus. How do I know? Notice what it says. Go on to the next verse. Verse 11, the Bible says, and they shall what? They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me how, from the least to the greatest. The Bible says that the new deal of God is the writing of this new covenant in our minds and in our hearts. My question tonight is, what does it mean to have the law in our minds? When the law is in our mind, do you know what that means? Because my brothers and sisters, unless we have experienced this new deal, we, when the test comes, would break the commandments of God instead of following the way of God. And the only way to stand when persecution comes, when every earthly support is cut off, is to have this law of God by the finger of Jesus written in our minds and in our hearts. This is what it means to be sealed. To be settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. And only if it's written there can we stand during this fearful conflict. What does it mean to have the law written in the mind? You know what that means? When the law of God is written in our minds, it means we know what the truth is. There are multitudes today that have no idea what the law is. But when we study the Bible, when we read through the word of God and we look at what that law says, there is nothing in God's law, in his commands, there is nothing there that we don't want in our minds. I mean, tell me, if you were to start going through all those Ten Commandments, which one would you want to do away with? 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make into any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down and serve them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. All of these things are the foundation of a government of law and of peace. And if we don't expect man to change his law, why would God change his law as if he was a fickle man? Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God wants to put that law in our minds. And to have the law in our minds means we know what it says. But that's not the New Deal. New Deal means more than laws in the mind. The law must also be where? I wonder what it means for the law to be in our hearts. For it to be in our mind means we know the truth. But old David said, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalms 40, verse 8. And so, brothers and sisters, to have the law in our minds means we know what God says. But to have the law in our hearts means we love to do what he says. And there's a great difference. You know, there's some people today that say, oh, I want to do this, but I just can't do it. That's not the new deal. There's some people that say, oh, Lord, I'm doing this, but I wish I didn't have to. God wants to give us an experience where we enjoy doing what he says. And my brothers and my sisters, only Jesus can write that law in our minds and hearts. And you know how he's going to do it? Let me, let me explain it this way. Is there any mother here that has a child that's under a year old in this room tonight? Is there any mother here that has a child under a year old that's in this room tonight? Praise the Lord. Now, you will allow me to ask a rather strange question to you just for the sake of what we're talking. Is your baby here tonight? Why don't you kill that baby? You love her, is that right? Amen. You heard what the mother said, is that right? Now, suppose I said to her, why don't you kill that baby? Suppose she said, well, don't you know, Pastor, that in North Carolina there's a law that says that if I kill my baby, I could be put in prison? And I could even face life in prison or even the electric chair. Is there a law that says if you kill the baby that you make it go into prison? Is there a law that says that? Is that what she said? No, that's not it, is it? Now, what if I said to her, why don't you kill the baby? And suppose she said to me, well, you know, Pastor, there is a law in the sanctuary in heaven. In the Ark of the Covenant, it says that thou shalt not kill. And if I kill my baby, I could burn in hell. Is that what she said? Is she thinking about hell or going to prison so that it stops her from killing her baby? That law of love is written in her heart. And she doesn't have to say, oh, I just want to kill the baby sometimes. I just hold myself back. Oh, that love makes it easy. Did you know that? You see, when the law of God is written in the mind and in the heart, not only do you know the truth in your mind, but when it's written in your heart, you delight to do it, you love to do it, you would rather die than break the commandments of Jesus. And those that go through this last fearful conflict, notice what the Bible says in Revelation 13. What book did I say? Revelation 13. Those that go through this last fearful conflict, the Bible says they're going to have to come to the place where that law is written not only in their mind, but through the blessed Lord, that law is written in their hearts, where not only do they know the truth, but in love they have allowed it to become the delight of their lives. And the Bible says in Revelation 13, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible speaking of the United States of America. Speaking of the great change that's about to take place, it says beginning in verse 11, and if you have not been here and studied this, you need to study it, amen? But verse 11 says, I beheld what? Another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake of the dragon. Those that were here and studied this with me, who is this represent? The United States of America. We prove from the Bible that the Bible tells us that this is America in prophecy. Now notice what it's going to do. Verse 16 says, it says, and he calls of all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark where? in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now notice verse 17. And that no man, how many? No man. And that no man might what? Buy or sell, save he that have what? The mark of the beast. The mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. We're told that America is going to be leading out and they're going to join forces with the Roman Catholic Church. Did I show you 
how many times that the Pope has been visiting America? Then I show you where it said on the front cover a few weeks ago when the Pope made his first papal visit to the United States of America, it said on the front cover of Time magazine, Why the Pope Loves America. And we have seen a type of union like never before. The Bible says as we near the end of time, America and Rome are going to get closer together. They're going to get so close that they're going to influence all the laws. In fact, you better watch. When you see the crisis get worse in America in the economy, do you know who is the richest organization in the world? Do you know who will come to the aid of the United States of America? Do you understand why there is a union taking place? Why the president, when he was asked in the public, what do you see when you look into the eyes of the Pope? And he said before the world, I see God. Now, my brothers and my sisters, you better understand what the Bible teaches. If you have never heard this, you better study like you've never studied before. Because the Bible says there's coming a time when or sell unless he goes along with his power or willing yet to stand with Jesus even if every earthly support is cut off. But it's going to get worse than that. The Bible says in verse 15, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in verse 15, let's read that together. The Bible says, and he had what? He had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should what? both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? I want to tell you something. If you believe the Bible, then there's coming a time when the United States of America is going to lead out with the Church of Rome that if you don't accept the observances of the church, if you don't go along with this power, the Bible says that you can even face death. And if you believe the Bible, it says it's coming a time when if you do not worship this beast or his image, that you will even be killed if you don't go along with it. Now I want to ask you something. What is it going to take to stand if you're going to be persecuted even to the point of death? Do you think you're ready to die for Jesus right now? You see, if we can't go and study our Bibles, if we spend more time watching desperate housewives than we do in studying our Bible, you think we're ready? If we spend more time watching the views on television, if we spend more time watching the sports of this world and the things of this world, and yet very few are the moments that are dedicated to prayer and the study of the scriptures. Let me tell you something. It's amazing how we want to be the friend of God and yet we're not friendly to Jesus. You know, if we were to treat our earthly friends the way we treat God, we wouldn't have any friends. Marriages would almost immediately be broken. And think about it. Most of us today, if we even talk to God at all, we may say something to him in the morning and say, Lord, now now lay me down to sleep and, and wake me up and get me ready to go to work. And you rush out, we'll cut on the news, maybe bite it, grab a bite on your way out, rush to work all day long at work. Come back home, maybe cut on the news and relax for a moment. And before long, you are almost fast asleep. And when you go to bed, you may say something to God at night. You can tally up the whole day on a few minutes. I want to ask you something. If a man were to wake up in the morning and see his, his wife or his husband and just wake up in the morning and say, hey, good morning, uh, honey, and then say anything else for the rest of the day, get back in the bed and say, good night, honey, and go to sleep, how long do you think that marriage will last? What type of friendship do you think they'll have? Now, why is it that we can treat God that way and still claim to love God, and yet in this earth we can say we love God and yet spend no time with Him? Don't you think we're deceiving ourselves? If we say we love somebody, wouldn't you want to spend time with the one you love? Why would you spend all your time in front of a television with all the killing and the stealing and the beating and the shooting and the homosexuality and all those things that put Jesus on the cross if you love Jesus? You see, if we love God, we're going to want to spend time with God on our knees and in prayer and in helping others to be brought into a better experience with God. You see, but God cannot help us as long as we lie to ourselves. Did you know that? If all we would do is be honest with God and say, Lord, I really don't love you. Lord, I really love my own way. Lord, I really love following in the ways of the world. If we would be honest with God, God can say, I know that. Just come to me. I can help you. Because I'm going to tell you something. If we don't love God, we'll never be able to stand through this last crisis. You see, brothers and sisters, do you know what it takes in order to be willing to give your life for Jesus? Because think about it. If we cannot give up some food on our plates, if we cannot give up some articles of dress and our clothing, 
If we cannot give up some worldly amusement in our life, what makes you think you'll give your whole life? You see, we are deceiving ourselves and many are going to come up to the time of trouble. They're going to come up to Jesus' second coming and will believe they're all right. And you know what the Bible says? Jesus is going to look at them and say, depart from me. I don't know who you are. You see, in order to know somebody, you have to spend time with them. And if we're not spending any time with Jesus, believe me, we don't know who he is. We are deceiving ourselves. Jesus says through the apostle Paul, if we say we know him and keep not his commandments, we are a liar. Amen. And do you know what it takes? To be willing to die for Jesus. You know what it takes? Just one word. The Bible says in John 15. As we get ready to close. Notice what the Bible says. As we get ready to close. The pianist can come forward. John 15. Beginning in verse 13. Notice what the Bible says. What is it going to take? To be willing to stand in a time when the whole world is being persecuted. And yet we can stand true to God and keep his commandments. Even when we're facing death. What is it going to take? Notice what the Bible says. John 15. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. And John 15 beginning in verses 13. Let's read that together. John 15 beginning in verse 13. The Bible says. Greater love have what? Have no man than this. That a man... Lay down his life. How? If we are going to be willing to give our life for Jesus. If we are going to be willing to stand for God even to the point of death. There is one thing we need. And Jesus says greater love. Have no man than this. Then what Lord? That a man would give his life. For who? I'm going to tell you something. If you don't know God, you're not going to give your life for him. Did you know that? If you don't know Jesus right now, they may say, yes, I'll do it. But if you don't really know and love God, you're not going to give your life for him. Don't even deceive yourself. If there's something in this world that you love more than Jesus, you're not going to give your life for him. If there's something in this world that you love more than God and you know the way you can know when you love something more than you love Jesus, let me tell you, easy way. When you're not willing to give it up. You see, Abraham was willing to give up his son because he loved God more than he loved his son. And because of it, God said, you don't have to do it. I just wanted to know that you love me more than anything else. I never forget, I was talking to a young man. I showed him the evils of rap music. I showed him. I said, I used to rap. I know everything about it. I know that the devil communicates with the mind of man to write the music. Demons visit the rap artists and give them the words and the performance power. And yet man can listen and yet not know he's lending his mind to the devil. The young man, he said, I see it from the Bible. I showed him all there. He said, yes, I see it. And he said, I, he said I can, I'm not addicted. I can give that music up whenever I want. I said, is that true? I said, give me all your CDs. He said, no, Pastor David, I can't do that. You see, when we're not willing to give something up, it proves that we love that thing more than we love God. If there's anything in your life, you just think about it. In your mind, you don't have to talk to everybody else. This is between you and God. You say, Lord, is there anything in my life? And for different people, it's different things. Some people love food more than they love Jesus. They don't care what God said. They don't care what the Bible says. They will eat whatever they want to eat. Their belly has become their God. There's some people, they love the pride of dress and adornment more than anything else. And they don't care what God says. They don't care about the simplicity of godliness. All they want to do is look good. So then when they walk in the church or a building, everybody just turns their head. Well, devil, the devil, Lucifer, he turned people's head. You know that, right? Bible says that he was covered with all type of jewels and in the presence of God you must understand to be covered with diamonds and gold and barnacle like Lucifer had before he fell when you read it in Ezekiel 28 and do you know the Bible says that God dwells in light unapproachable? Can you imagine what a diamond would look like in the presence of God? You talk about bling, the devil was the king of bling. And all the world was moved by him but because of his pride. Because he was caught up in his own style, he fell from heaven. And many are falling like flies because they love their appearance more than they love Jesus. We forgot that God is not looking as man looks. God does not look at our fine suits and all of the things we do to dress ourselves up. God is looking at our hearts. 
And he wants to see how many love me. We can't fool God. We can fool everybody else, but we can't fool Jesus. And there are many today that are loving things more than they love Jesus. And you must think in your heart, is there anything more than I love God? Because the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the Father, the love of the world is not in him. But do you know, if you were to come to Jesus and say, Lord, I love sin. I love the world. And I can't do anything about it. Can't we do anything by ourselves? The Bible says, without me, you can do. If we would just come and say, Lord, I messed up. I know I'm not doing right. I know I don't know you. I do not have an experience with you. But Lord, today, I want to be saved. You know there's not a man in the world that could not be saved on a program like that. I don't care how many sins he's committed. I don't care how much murder. I'll never forget I was at one particular place and a man who was convicted of murder was at the meetings where we were and he was there and he said how, how he could not accept any of the messages that he heard before. He said, but when I look into your eyes, I see you believe what you're preaching. And he said, do you think that God can take me? I said, listen, Jesus went to the cross of Calvary so that if you have sinned there is a way of escape that no matter what we have done no matter how many mistakes husbands have made in their homes no matter how many mistakes mothers have made with their children and with their husbands or their wives do you know that brothers and sisters there is a plan of redemption there's a way that no matter how many mistakes we've made that God can help us but we gotta come to Jesus we got to come to God and say, Lord, I'm going to play fair with you. I'm honest. I need you to create within me a clean heart because I promise you, when this time of trouble breaks out, when this sunny law goes everywhere and persecution is all across the world, man is going to wish that they knew God. But it's going to be too late for some at that time. But do you know tonight it's not too late? Do you know that if we only had love, Everything would be easy. The whole issue of the great controversy is about love. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll do whatever I say, whether the command is in diet or dress or education or in the recreation or in relationships or in the way we spend our time and money. It doesn't matter what it is. If we only love Jesus, it would make it easy. Did you know that? All we need is the love of God. If we can focus our minds on that love of God, do you know if we can come to the place where everything that Jesus says, we could not wait to do it. You know, men would do some crazy things in the sake of love. Is that right? I had a brother. He was a crazy, crazy person. And I remember that before we were converted, well, we won't even talk about it. We would just say it was a crazy situation. And my brothers and my sisters, I remember one time we were going to the mall and we were trying to do something that now I know better I should have been struck down. But we were talking to a bunch of girls just getting phone numbers all across the mall. And then my brother saw this one girl and he said, you know what, I want to get her phone number. And this boy followed her all the way into the church, uh, out of the uh, mall. He's following her and she wasn't giving the time of day. She was just turning this way and that way. You know how girls can do when they don't want you to talk to them. You know what they do. And he would not give up. She got into the parking lot. He's following out to the parking lot saying, this fool, what is he doing? And all of a sudden, she gets into a car and he's, she's getting ready to leave. And my brother jumped on the window and said, please give me a number. The windshield wiper came on. The, the rain hit him in the face. And she said, you're so crazy. I just, I, I, I got to do it. And she gave him the phone number. And he said, see, I told you I can do it. Now, I'm not going to call that love. I'm not going to call that love. I'm going to call that foolishness. But man, for the sake of something, would do some strange things. Do you know that if false love can do that, what could the real love of God do? You know, brothers and sisters, I'll never forget reading the story where a woman had married a man that she didn't love. And that man tried to force her to do everything. He said, you would have to wake up at 4.30 in the morning, have my breakfast on the table at 5, have my clothes pressed 
so that I can be out the door by 5.35. And that woman was struggling, trying to do all of these lists of things that she tried to do just to make her husband happy. And she felt like her life was in heavy drudgery. Can you imagine living like that? Just one moment after another, something else to do, something else to do. Feeling like there was no time of joy and peace. And she hated her life. And then one day, her husband died. And instead of her being sad, she was happy that she was released from her bondage. And then she met a man that she really loved. And when she met that man that she loved, she fell in love with him, developed the relationship. They ended up getting married. One day she was cleaning the house and she was up in the attic somewhere. And all of a sudden, she didn't know it. She had some old boxes from her old marriage. And out came that little list. Wake up at 4.30 in the morning. Have that breakfast at the ready at 5. Make sure my clothes is pressed at 5.30 so we're ready to go at 5.35. And to her surprise, she looks at the list now. And that list that used to make her cry when she saw it all day long, something else to do. She looked in every one of them she was doing for her new husband. And she didn't even know it. You know what made the difference? Just love. You see, brothers and sisters, when you love God, it's not hard to keep the commandments of Jesus. Now, if you don't love God, you can dress how you want, eat what you want, do whatever you want. But Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do you know it's impossible for man to put this type of love in his own heart? Did you know that? The unconsecrated cannot originate it nor produce it. It dwells only in the heart where Jesus reigns. Human effort, the exercise of the wheel, they all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. They may even produce an outward correctness of behavior. But my friends, they cannot change the heart. I'm going to close with this. This comes from a little book called Steps to Christ, page 44. One of the most beautiful words. Listen. There are those who profess to serve God. While they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law. To form a right character and to secure salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ. But they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. Such religion is worth nothing. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love, with the joy of communing with him, that it will cleave to him and in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. It says love to Christ will be the spring of action. Those who feel the constraining love of God do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements of God. They do not ask for the lowest standard, but aim at perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. With earnest desire, listen to this, I love this part, with earnest desire, they yield all and manifest an interest proportionate to the value of the object which they seek. A profession of Christ. A what? A profession of Christ. Without this deep love is mere talk. Dry formality and heavy drudgery. Oh, my brothers and sisters, tonight I want to ask you, do you have this love for Jesus? You may say, Lord, I don't have it like I want to. But I want more of this love for God. I want my life to be in harmony with Jesus. That when he comes, I'll be ready to meet him. Oh, brothers and sisters, we're closing this meeting. But somebody has an opportunity to make a, sal a decision for salvation. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, and I'm going to ask. If there's somebody here today that says, Lord... I know that I don't have this love for God. I love the world more than I love Jesus. But Jesus, today, I want you to do something different. I'm just going to ask that you will raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, Lord, I want this love in my heart. 
And if you want God to do something special that perhaps has never been done in your heart before, perhaps you've never given your heart to Jesus, or maybe you gave it to him, but you took it back, and you want to give him your heart again tonight, because if Jesus does not have your heart, you're not ready. But if you want to give God your heart tonight, then I'm going to ask that you simply raise your hand and get out of your seat and come forward to the front so we can have a special prayer. If you want God to do something special in your heart tonight, to give, praise God, to give you a love that would make following His commands easy. I'm just going to ask that you'll slip out of your seat and come forward as we have a special prayer and we close tonight. Somebody that says, Lord, I want an experience like never before. Praise God. And I want God to put me back in the right place. I want this love. So that when all the world breaks loose, that I will know Jesus, that I would have accepted that new deal where the law of God will be written not only in my mind, but it's going to be in my heart. Oh, brothers and sisters, the crisis has just begun. The times are going to get much more troublous. We're going to see disaster on every hand. We're going to see America looking like it's falling to pieces. And then men are going to wish that they had a hold on God. But brothers and sisters, those who take their stand tonight, those who are asking for that love, oh, God is going to help you to stand when no one else can stand. God is going to help you to stand in a time when all the world is bowing to the beast and his image. God is going to give you the power of love. And if we have that love, oh, I promise, we'll be saved. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it's going to be like? Can you imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus finally comes? And all of the things that we've been through for him. All of the tribulation. All of the trouble. All of the sorrow and the suffering would have come to an end. And Jesus will say, well done, my good and faithful children. You have been faithful in the least. Now I'm going to give you much more. He's going to say, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Can you imagine having Jesus put a crown upon your head? And you will look at him and say, Lord, but I didn't do anything. And Jesus said, but you let me into your heart. And as a result, many are going to take those crowns that Jesus has placed upon their heads and they're going to cast them at the feet of God and they're going to say, heaven is cheap enough. Oh, my brothers and sisters, we got to be there. Oh, Pastor, Pastor, would you stand beside me? I love this man. I love this family. You have been given a treasure with the family ministry that you have here. Oh, my brothers and sisters, please, this may be the last time that you have to accept Jesus. I may never be able to step foot in, my, in this church again. You may never even make it home. And tonight, you need to be sure that your heart is right with God. Oh, he loves us, brothers and sisters. Somebody says, well, look at what I've done, Pastor. I'm so terrible. Do you know what I've done? Well, I know if you knew what I've done, I couldn't preach to you if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus. But I know something else. That there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners can plunge beneath that flood and lose all of their guilty stains. I don't care what it is. If we come to Jesus, there's not a reason that one has to be lost. Not one. Not one. Tonight, we can say, Lord, I want to have a new experience. Tonight is going to be different. When I go home tonight, Lord, I'm going to kneel on my knees. I'm going to give my family completely to you. Tonight is the night. Will you make that decision with me? My brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what everybody else is going to do. But as for me and my house, by the grace of God, we're going to serve the Lord. Is that your desire? I'm going to ask Pastor if you'll say a special prayer. Let us pray. 
Father, we have been before you night after night. And we've gained more than we can imagine. And we just want to die to self. And let you rule and reign in our lives. Please, O oh God, accept our hearts. Make them holy thine. Won't you tabernacle in us every day? Yes. Show yourself to be God for us and in us. May we not do anything that misrepresents you. Yes. Thank you for this, your son called Jeremiah. And his wife and daughter, they have come to serve us in your name. And Lord, we want to make sure that our names stay in the book of life by making sure that we're at one with Jesus. So abide in us. Never let us go. Give us a new kind of way of thinking. New kind of way of walking. Yes. Night after night, oh God, we have at least dedicated two hours to you. Travel time to these meetings and travel time home and the time spent here. If we would just keep on giving yes. you that time every night yes. during the week, what a mighty force we would be for the kingdom's sake. Father, we're not interested in false religion. Yes, Lord. We're not trying to mimic anybody but Jesus. Help this thing to be real in us for time yes, won't last much longer. Teach us to have country living before we move to the country. Yes. May we get rid of those things in our homes that shackle us and keep us earthy when we need to be heavenly. Take this taste out of our mouths Please, for that Lord. which is unspiritual. Give us a craving for that which is of you. Yes. Oh God, we thirst after being like you. Even the children beg to be baptized because they even know that time is almost over. Yes. The world is getting mean, oh God. Calamities are increasing and we can see it for ourselves. Give us the good sense to make every sacrifice right now to be safely in your care when trouble comes. Thank you for all those who've come forward and those who come forward even though they've stayed in their seats but their hearts are given to you. Oh Father, accept us as your very own. And then launch us against a world that's full of hatred, immorality, and rebellion. Help us to be different yes. and unique. Help us to be like you. And that can only happen by keeping continually beholding you. So bless all of us, O oh God. May we go out to do your bidding. May every word be spoken after the prompting of your spirit. May every thought be thought after your thinking. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forevermore. Let the church say, Amen. I want to say as we get ready to conclude this series, that there has been those that have come to me and they've asked, where can I get these materials that I can study from? There are those that wanted to know the information. We sent out a newsletter around this country and around the world every month and if you would just be interested in being on that newsletter if you would simply write down your address we will have a table set up in the back and there are those that have also asked about CDs and DVDs and books and materials that they can continue to study this information because this is something that we need as a family to study amen, amen. and we're going to have study tools in the back where you can go by and make sure as a family you can invest in something that can bring more joy than the investments we make at Blockbuster. Amen? Amen. That's something that is going to do something for our eternal salvation so that our family can be saved in the kingdom. Everything. We have things for all families, for relationships, getting ready in this last hour because brothers and sisters, if ever there was a time 
When we wanted to be ready to meet Jesus, that time is now. Amen. I'm going to love you. We're going to be leaving. And I'm going to be praying for you and I ask that you pray for me. And whatever we do, let's make sure we meet at the meeting place if we don't meet on this earth. You know, we talk to our family and friends and we say, listen, if we don't see you in this earth, let's meet at the sea of glass. What do you say? And let's be able to stand there victorious over the beast and over his image and over the name of his name and say, Lord, because of the power of God, because of the blood of Jesus, because of the word of our testimony, let's stand there and fellowship through eternity. What do you say? I'm going to be praying for you. Let nothing turn you back from the fire that has been placed upon your heart today. Amen? All you candidates, please, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And I'm going to tell you this little story as we dismiss. Some people might see a little joke in it if they just listen to the outward words. But those who are really listening, they're going to see something much more serious. But I'll never forget of reading and hearing about a woman that was obese. And she was trying to find out how to lose weight. And she went to a specialist, a doctor, a physician, who could explain to her how to lose weight. And his track record was perfect. Everybody that came to him and did what he said, every one of them lost the weight came healthy just where God wanted them to be and this particular lady she came to this specialist this physician and she said sir I I hear that you have a program that can't fail and he said well yes the program works she said would you explain the program to me and he began to explain the program he showed her the change of diet and the health and the exercise and all the rest that she would have to do the program that never failed and, and, and he gave her a perfect program and then he said, if you don't have any questions, then you can just simply follow the program and you'll see the results. And she said, he said, do you have any questions? She says, no. Well, I just have one question about the diet. And he said, well, what is the question? And she looked at him very intently and she said, no, I don't have any problem with the diet that you gave me. I don't mind changing the diet. I don't have any problem with this diet, but I just have one question. Am I to take the diet before or after my regular meal? Do you know what her problem was? Do you think that she would work on a program like that? And I say it very reverently. That if we try to take what Jesus says and try to add it to what we're doing right now and believe we're going to be saved, I say it reverently that even Jesus cannot save us in a program like that. If we're going to be saved by Jesus, we must be willing to not hold on to Christ and the world. We must surrender all to Jesus. You ever been on a trip and you put everything in the bag that you can put in and you just try to put more in and you can't get anything else on there? You sit on top of the bag trying to get something else in. Is that right? But it comes to the place where nothing else can come in and the only way that you can get something else in you have to take something else out. There are only 24 hours in a day. And if 24 of those hours nothing man can do can give us a 25 hour day. And so if we are already using 24 hours and yet Jesus only has a few minutes we can't expect Jesus to add a more hours in a day. We must be willing to say, Lord, something else has to go so that you can come in. Are you with me? Oh, I have a series back there. I wish I could give one to the whole church. We don't even have enough. But there are some ones that you can get that talks about how to pray. People don't know how to pray. Brothers and sisters, it's time to learn to commune with Jesus. This book right here changed my life. This book that we put together here talking about this friendship. You need to learn how to become a friend of God. And if you don't have anything else, if you would just go to God in a quiet place with nobody else and just talk to him. Before the night is over, go to God and just say, Lord, I want to start over tonight. I want to become a friend of God. Teach me how. Because if we start beholding Jesus, you know what will happen? We're going to become changed. But if we take these eyes and focus them at the world. We'll be changed, but not into the image of God. Let you and I take the cameras of our brains and use the lenses of our eyes and expose it to the love of God. 
And if you'll do that with your Bible, Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, and on your knees, let God talk to you through the Bible and through Desire of Ages. And then tell God what you think about it. Tell Him if you're reading, say, Lord, I see you're dying on that cross. Was it really for me? Do you really love me that much? Ask Him. Tell Him, Lord, I'm thankful for what you've done. Make it real to me that sin hurts your heart. And when sin hurts you, the way it hurt Jesus, you will leave it alone just as he does. When a child puts his hand on the stove and it's on and it's hot, you know what he's going to do? You know why? It hurts. And if you see what sin does to Jesus, if you see it crucifies him afresh, it's going to hurt you. You would rather die than break the command of God because you break his heart. And when you love Jesus like that, he can close probation. He can seal us and he can say they're perfectly safe to save. They would rather die than break the commands of God. Is there power in the blood of God? There should be so much power that if a flea, if a mosquito were to bite us, they should come out screaming, there's power in the blood. My brothers and my sisters, I love you. May God bless you. Let's pray for each other. Let's be found in the kingdom of God.